2 Corinthians as we uh, just continue uh, to study through the Bible. And we'll tackle chapter 2 today. You know, people often act differently based on who their audience is. You know, uh, how they act, the, the, what they say, the way they say it. You know, I can just imagine maybe one or two of you, if you are one of those folks that really enjoy singing at the top of your lungs and dancing while you're driving around in your car. You know, if you're like that, you know, you, you probably wouldn't do that here in front of all of us. You might, but you probably won't. But you, if you're alone in the car, you would. Uh, or if you had a, your best friend with you, you might go for it there with them. You know, I've, <laughs> we have home movies uh, of me doing some kind of embarrassing things, horsing around with my kids over the years. And, and I just do that with them. You know, I wouldn't do that here with you because it's just they're my audience, you know. And uh, I'm just trying to connect with them in a way that I can, you know. Um, but... Today, we're actually going to look at um, our behavior when God is the audience. And that really, that's how I should live my life. Always, whether it's singing here with you guys this morning, or when we in the car ride home, or wherever it is that we go, that I would live with the knowledge of the presence of God with me all the time, because he is, and that that, that would change how I live. Um, a holy, separated uh, life that we should live. Uh, there's a, a expression called an audience of one, <laughs> that we would live for an audience of one, the Lord himself. And there's power in that. And that's, uh, you know, some of the reason why it's, uh, it's necessary and also why we're going to talk about that uh, here today. As a matter of fact, here in chapter 2, Paul is going to show us two things that happen. We're going to look at two parts here. Uh, that there's going to be an increase if you will commit to living for that audience of one. That God is your audience. That on, on, in the first part, we're going to see that there's uh, just great power in forgiveness. The power of forgiveness will just be around you and through you and for you if you will live with that uh, audience of of. Of the Lord. And then, second part, we're going to look at that Paul shows us not only is there an increase in the power of forgiveness, but in part two, we're going to see there's an increase in the fragrance of Christ around you to those who believe and those who don't believe. So, there's a lot riding on this as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I just pray that you'll be ministered to uh, through uh, Paul the Apostle's words here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So let's start here in part 1 with the power of forgiveness, I call it. And it's uh, verse 1. Here's what uh, the Apostle said. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, having confidence in you all, excuse me, that my joy is the joy of you all. So I'll stop there for a moment. The tone and the subject of First Corinthians, which we went through about a year ago or so, was uh, different. Than Second Corinthians, and you'll see as we go through. If you're here for that, First um, Corinthians was more harsh than this than this one is, um, and it's because Paul was correcting a lot of sin issues in First Corinthians, things like immoral behavior and uh, church division and drunkenness amongst the saints. Uh, Things like the spiritual gifts, uh, the supernatural spiritual gifts that God gives. They were being abused in their meetings in 1 Corinthians, um, and he addressed those. Uh, There was some false teaching on the resurrection going around. And so what Paul did is he wrote to them to teach them rightly and correct them from the things that they were doing wrong. And so uh, he sent that letter, and then later Titus came back and was kind of a messenger uh, and, and told Paul that, you know, they had turned it around, this church, and they were doing, they were doing well now. Things that were different. 
uh, than, than what was going on. And so, now Paul says there in starting off this chapter here that the second time now that he's writing them, he's glad that he doesn't have to be sorrowful anymore about those things that were going on, the sin in that church. He says, now I'm, I'm looking forward to being with you. You know, you made me sorrowful before, and now you're making me rejoice from what I'm hearing, the good news. It seems like he just wanted things to be settled with them before he showed up so that he wouldn't have to show up and deal with all of this turmoil that he could just, they could just enjoy one another. And so remember when we go through this, that this was a letter, a personal letter sent by the apostle that planted that church and the people who he loves, right? So there's, while there's lots of instruction and practical Christian living for you and I today that we can apply, it was between him and them, and it was personal. And so he says those things. And he goes on in verse 4, and he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Okay, so he says that um, uh, he had great concern and actually great grief for them before. Now, one of the things that makes him just an awesome servant of God, and even though the first Corinthians was a little, had some some little rough parts in it um, because of the corrective nature of it, he, he isn't pointing fingers at them. That's not who he is. You know, he's actually sad with them. Can you tell that when you read this? He's like in it with them. And I think that that's a mark of a growing Christian. You know, I mentioned having that, being in the audience of God and living your life in his presence. He is, but sometimes we have to consciously do that and put ourselves there so that we can be like that. We can come alongside someone rather than pointing fingers at them, saying, you ought to be like that. You ought to change. Look at you, you know, that kind of a thing. Now, you may be right by saying that, but that's not the way um, that you do it. You come alongside them. And that was the ministry of Paul. And that's why he says things like, imitate me like while I imitate Christ, because that's what Jesus would do, right? And he says there in verse 4, the reason why, He is like that. And did you see that? He says, because uh, he loved them so much. (laughs) Uh, Love is a great motivator for treating people well and with grace. He had anguish and was brokenhearted, he's telling us, because he cared so much about them. You know, Paul just had a desire to see people walking with God like him. Not that he was perfect, but that His desire was just to live his life in the audience of God. And he wanted to see other people like that because it's the better life. (laughs) He knows that. Have a great fellowship with the Lord. That's where it's at, you know. But when it's not like that, then he says it's heaviness, you know, around him. And so, you know, maybe you're somebody who just is just really connected with Jesus in your life. And you can identify with him because maybe there's, there's uh, someone in your life who you've, you're watching who they're stumbling around and not doing well. And, and it's all because they're just sort of resistant at this time to connect closely with God. And, and maybe you can kind of understand the sort of feeling that he had, the great love and desire to see them increase in fellowship uh, with God. And so I say all that because... Um, he, I don't think he really enjoys confronting Christians. <laughs> I don't think there's hardly anybody that enjoys confronting Christians. Maybe there's, there's some. But he does it because it was necessary. And it was driven by love. Um, you know, love is also uh, confrontational sometimes. You know, oftentimes it seems like the Christian church today thinks it's, it's loving when we don't say anything that might offend someone else. And that's not true at all. You know, I don't want to be offensive in my own self, but if I have to uh, minister the word and it offends somebody in some way, well, that's their problem with God. You know, it's necessary. Love tells the truth. And, uh, And so that's who he was. And it's a great example for us to follow. 
Now he says this, and uh, the tone kind of changes a little bit. Verse 5, he says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me. But all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. And so as I said earlier, um, he's, he's, he's going to be focusing here on the power of forgiveness for the next uh, several verses and how um, um, as we walk with the Lord and we desire to be close to him, it will I- increase your ability to be forgiving and to do it like God would do it. Because <clears throat> one of the things that was corrected before in that church was uh, they were, were tolerating sexual immorality um, by Christians. As a matter of fact, <laughs> that church previously was pretty proud of how progressive they were with looking the other way when these things were going on amongst them. Now, I wanted you to get some background of what he's talking about here in verse 5. So if you could, for a moment, would you hold your place here and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I just want to read the first few verses there so that you can understand uh, what exactly that he's speaking of. 1 Corinthians 5, and I'm just going to start with verse 1, and I'll, I'll read that and then give you some comments on that, and we'll go back to where we were. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he has done this deed, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Huh. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly our unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And I'll stop there. So in a nutshell, a Christian guy was engaged in sexual sin with his stepmom. And so Paul calls them on it. He says, what are you guys doing there? Because everybody's looking the other way. They're not really calling the guy on it. He's saying, this can't continue. It's going to affect the whole church. That's what he means when he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So he actually instructed them to kick the guy out of the church. And don't let him come back unless he repents. He even says, turn him over to Satan, a Christian. Turn him over to Satan. Let him go a few rounds with the devil. Right? Wake him up. He says he needs to stop it or he's going to be destroyed. And so that's part of what the church is supposed to be like. And apparently they did. Because the man turned away from sin and he changed. And so that's where we find ourselves. Now go back to chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. By the way... um, if you read the rest of that chapter on your own, you'll note that he's speaking about Christians, not about non-believers. Sometimes it seems like the church treats non-believers like that. Like somebody is a, is a sinner because that's what sinners do is they sin. And so somebody who's not a Christian yet will be treated and will be sort of disowned and not uh, um, you know, um, spoken to or, or, or talked to or reached out to because of the wicked things that they do. But Paul says, don't be like that. We are the light for those people. He's speaking specifically about Christian behavior in that chapter. And that Christian behavior, unrepentant sin in the Christian church is not to be tolerated. And, and we've actually had to have people ask them not to come back here until they've repent. It doesn't happen very often because most people 
<laughs> when they have the Holy Spirit in them, will repent and turn and stop doing those things. But it happens, and we're supposed to do that. And it's the loving thing to do. And that's what Paul is showing us here. So back here in chapter 2 of Second Corinthians, look what he's doing in such a grace, gracious way in verse 5. He tells them to not be too severe. Isn't that great? He says, you guys were really good at the correct correction part, but be careful because you could be too severe with folks. You know, and that's what's sometimes misunderstood about church discipline or, or just our own personal relationships with each other as Christian, that um, this is not, turning them over to Satan is not a punitive thing. <laughs> it sounds like it is. But it, it really isn't. The objective of correction in this way, uh, it comes from God and it's to get people to repent, to turn. To turn back so they don't destroy themselves. It's a love-oriented thing that is actually done. The goal is always for restoration. God loves to restore people and so should we. And so it's not for just punishment. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's for punishment really at all. And so he says, when you do do these things, then be careful about being too severe to take it uh, too far. He continues and gives a little more detail. Verse 6 and 7, he says, This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So... (laughs) Paul says, if the guy repented, lighten up. (laughs) Lighten up. Take it easy on him. And this is good for us to hear because if you've ever been offended by somebody who's a so-called brother or sister in the Lord, sometimes we we want people to keep on paying for how they've offended us. You know what I'm talking about? Well, let's let them think about that for just a little while longer. I'm not going to forgive them just yet. You know, I'm not sure you, you really understand just how much you hurt me. I'm not going to forgive you just yet. Maybe later. Or, or um, oh, all right, I'll forgive you. <laughs> but you better watch it, buster. You know, I'm keeping my eyes on you, making sure if you do it again. But what did Jesus say about this? He said, if anyone offends us and they repent, what are we supposed to do? Forgive them. (laughs) Even, even if they've done the same thing before. And Paul tells us the reason there, right in verse 7. You you got your Bibles open to it. Verse 7, it says, so they won't be swallowed up with too much sorrow. That's a really good reason. Now, why would that be important, that they wouldn't be swallowed up in too much sorrow? Well, again, because the goal is restoration, right? (laughs) The goal is for God to draw them back, and they would turn from that thing they were doing, and they would be restored and made stronger. You know, what's an amazing thing that God can do is he can take ashes and make beauty from it. (laughs) Not that we ought to desire to... (laughs) to to go against him and do those things. But God can miraculously actually grow us stronger through stupid things that we've done in in our past. And so he says, let let him come back and welcome him back so he doesn't get um, discouraged. Give him lots of grace, not harshness, forgiveness. It's power in that. And walking with the Lord in your life, you desire to be close to him, you will increase in your desire to be forgiving um, to people. Did you see there in verse 7 that Paul um, said to not only forgive, but what else did he say to do there? Did you notice? He said to comfort him too. So it's different objective here. That was a, a word that was used a lot in chapter 1 last week if you were here. Uh, that word comfort there in the original language means to come alongside. Um, it's a, it's a, used, a word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit in the original Greek language. And uh, the idea is, is that uh, you would exhort them and that you would seek to strengthen them, not just put up with them. Okay, whatever. 
So why is that so important? Why is it so important that we would be comforters like that, not, not just forgivers? Well, I think it's because there's a part of us that wants to hang on to the past. I don't know if you're anything like me, but I think of some of the things that I did before I was a Christian, even some of them that, since I've been a believer, and I wish I wouldn't have done them. And, you know, you, I, I know, because some of you have told me your stories, that you struggle. Some of you struggle with these things, that you really hang on to some of the things that you've done in the past. And, and that's sort of in our nature um, to do that. And if we have any reason to, sometimes we won't let things go. And that sort of thing can really stunt the development of a Christian. If I live in that, I'm always going to be back there someplace instead of going there. you know. And so Paul says, here's what you guys do. Those of you who are walking in the Spirit, you be part of the solution and build them up. People who've crashed and burned, <laughs> help them up, dust them off, and let's walk this way together with them. It's part of the solution. It's great. He even emphasizes, look at verse 8, he says it another way, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. It's awesome when the Bible goes into love. <laughs> it's just music to our soul, you know. Because here's the problem, when a person has, has, uh, has um, you know, a believer has sinned, you know, done something horrible. It's tragic, obviously. We all agree that. But, and if they continue in it like this guy had been doing, um, it's necessary to, as the Bible tells us, to separate from them. It's for their own good. But when there's confession and repentance of sin, there's got to be a place for restoration and, and bringing them back into full fellowship in Jesus Christ, the body. Unfortunately, and this is what Paul is teaching against, unfortunately, many take a harsh attitude and just cut people off forever. You know, you, that guy did that to me, I'm never speaking to him again. That's not right. That's not the body of Christ. Instead, when somebody stumbles and gets back up, forgive them. It's love, Paul says, verse 8. You know, I think it's super important to reaffirm love to those who apologize. <laughs> you know, we try to do that in our house. And I try to do that with the saints when I, you know, I've bumped heads with people, you know, just because we're different, you know. And, and, uh, and we come from different perspectives and we see things differently. And, and some are introverts, some are extroverts. And, you know, and, 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 and so we will tend to disagree and even sometimes bump heads, <laughs> As we do it, and then you apologize, and, and, and we're supposed to reaffirm our love to one another when, when people um, do that. And, it, and it's because it lets people know that we really do forgive them. We forget it, you know. Those are the sort of things that build people up. And if you're not doing this in your family, I would urge you to try it. You know, we really need to be freely forgiving and apologizing uh, to one another and to really love them through it. You know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 6 that not only is this for others, but it's for us that are doing the forgiving too. He says that um, those of us who are offended, um, we ought to be really um, forgiving because we can be tempted in that same thing if we don't. You know, because what happens is, <laughs> you know, you're like, well... <laughs> I don't have that problem. <laughs> and you get sort of all prideful. And then the next thing you know, you're stumbling in the very same thing. And so when you forgive someone and you reaffirm your love towards them, what it does is it humbles you in a way where you're, you, you come alongside that person and you walk with them through it instead of just, you know, being all judgy about it, which is, uh, can stumble a person. He said in verse 9, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. <laughs> and so he's letting them know that part of the reason that he writes to them is to see whether or not they're obedient to God in this thing that he wants them um, to do. He says essentially this, I put you guys to the test before 
to see if you would confront the guy. And you did. You passed that test. But now I'm putting you to the test to see if you can love him. You see how the importance is here of both? You know, because maybe they were people that confronted easier than they loved. Or maybe they were people, vice versa, that they loved easier than they confronted. How about you? You know, maybe you're just that really loving and forgiving person, and, but you sort of avoid all confrontation. <laughs> I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't talk to them about anything like that, you know. My wife's grandmother, <laughs> would, uh, at one point, when we would like have dinner and, and like a, a, a difficult subject would come along, maybe a family dispute or whatever, she would always change the subject. Everybody would want to talk about it and get it out in the open or whatever, and she'd be like, well, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something really nice, <laughs> you know? And so some of us are just like that, you know? We just don't want any confrontation, right? Or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum. You love confrontation, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you like really like to get in it and all that. And you're like, but what is this love thing that you speak of? I've never heard of that, you know. <laughs> it's a balance here, right? Because they're both in Scripture. So what God does is he puts you to the test in them. Because God tests the faith of all the believers, all of us go through tests, you know, and it's to, uh, to reveal what's in your heart. He knows what you're all about, but it's for you to discover what's really in your heart. It's, you know, remember when you were in school and you used to take tests? The reason that you took those tests is so that you, you could measure what was going on in your head, right? Were you, were you really getting the information? Um, you know, did you get a C minus on the test? Well, then you probably didn't really absorb the, the, the subject material, right? You really know the material. Well, God gives you tests to see what's going on in your heart so you can understand that. So you can find out if you are, like he said there in verse 9, are you really obedient in all things? <laughs> you know, or are you more like a C minus <laughs> student? Right? Are you really applying these things that he wants you to? Now, he says in verse 10, Whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For in, if, if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So again, the, 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 the goal here is to increase that forgiveness attitude, the power of it in your life and in the lives of others by seeking that presence of God, the audience uh, of the Lord. And he says it's good because uh, you get to know the tactics of your enemy. It's good to know the tactics of the devil, <laughs> The Bible teaches them. He doesn't, it doesn't overly emphasize Satan, but it's good to know your enemy and what they're about and what he does. He's basically saying, you know, I forgive and you guys forgive, but Satan wants you to think that there isn't any forgiving. And so you have to watch out for the, for the wiles of the devil. Here's what the problem with the devil is when it comes to stuff like this. He can win twice through this stuff. The first way that, the, that Satan wins is in the original sin that the person does. You know, if somebody says, say that a believer goes and gets really drunk one night. Well, Satan wins <laughs> that night because that guy got drunk and he shouldn't be drunk. We're Christians aren't supposed to be drunk. We're supposed to be filled with the spirit <laughs> and not filled with wine. <laughs> and so Satan wins that little battle, right? But that person... Can, Satan can also win a second thing with that person, a second uh, uh, victory, because that, that guy can become overwhelmed in sorrow by not finding forgiveness, like at home or, or something like that. And, and so Paul is letting us know, um, be careful of that, because sometimes the enemy can't destroy the person in the sin itself, but they will try making them think that they can never be forgiven for it 
or everybody's thinking about it when they're walking around and all that kind of thing. You see, Satan tries to cheat you out of what rightly belongs to you as a child of God. And he uses these various, uh, as Paul calls it, devices there in verse 11. So he's letting us know, don't be oblivious to the schemes of the devil. Because here's what happens. He comes along and I imagine him saying things to us like, oh, come on. You don't expect God to forgive you. You knew what you were doing. Do you think it's that easy to get forgiveness from God, a holy God? Look at you. You know, just ask God and he's going to take you back. Ha! That's not going to happen. It's not that simple, man. You got to do something now to earn favor back to God. These are the things that Satan whispers to people. So now you better start mopping up the kitchen for a couple of months or so, and then maybe they might forgive you. Or <laughs> like they did to me in high school. I went to high school in Chicago, and I, it was long enough ago that they had high school freshman initiation. They probably couldn't get away with that today. They did all sorts of creepy things to us back then. And one of the things that they made us do at high school uh, um, uh, um, initiation was they made us push a penny down this long hall with our noses. <laughs> you know, just from one end of the hall to the other. And, and you know, those are the kind of things that we... We can sort of, the enemy can sort of make us think like, well, you have to do this thing in order to pay penance for the forgiveness that is rightly due you. But that's not what the Bible says. John said in John chapter 1 verse 9, he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's good news. So if you're here today and you are carrying around guilt for something, Christian, that you've done in the past, don't. <laughs> Just go talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. If you can, go and apologize to the person that you offended, if that's what it was, was about. And God will take it away. He's quick to forgive. He wants to do it. All unrighteousness, John said. But maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian yet. You and I both know that you've done things that you're ashamed of. Because I've done them. And some of them we did in ignorance. Some of them did we, we did purposely. Um, the Bible says that we reveal that we're sinners by our actions. That we're separated from God. And I think that we all know that we've done things that aren't good. Some of them um, to a greater degree than others. And I want you to know that you can't forget them and God doesn't look the other way either. He remembers them all. He keeps track of all of these things. But just like I said, if you will confess your sins to him, he will forgive you. If you will put your faith in Jesus Christ and believe that God is powerful enough to take away all your sins because he died on the cross in your be on your behalf, in your place, and you would put your faith and trust in that man, Jesus Christ, you will have forgiveness of sins, everything that you've ever done, and he will give you eternal life, and you will be with him one day in paradise. <laughs> and that's for years. It's free for the taking, but you've got to do it uh, by faith. God wants to forgive you because he loves you. He went to great lengths, not just for me, for the pastor, <laughs> or for the worship people or whatever, this is for everyone in the world if they will take it. And I pray that you would. And just in a few minutes, the pastors are going to come uh, down front when we close, out, close up in prayer. And I want to ask that you, if you want to put your faith in Jesus, that you would come and talk to one of us. And we would love to pray with you. Um, if you um, are having trouble letting go of past sins, come and pray with us. I'll pray with you and help you with that. You can do this on your own. But I would love to help you. We would love to pray with you. Especially if you want to receive Jesus as your Savior and guide you uh, into that. So we learned here that when God is the audience, there's an increase in the power of forgiveness. Never forget that. Not only for, for others, but for you too. It's great. 
Well, Paul's not done. We're going to do part two here also, and we'll finish on time. Um, um, part two here, we're going to look at if uh, when we're in the presence of God that uh, or his audience, I should say, that um, um, we experience and give off the fragrance of Christ. So let's look at that beginning in verse 12. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Okay, so Paul, as I've stated already, he was unsettled because of the uh, problems that were going on there in, in, in Corinth. But he had this opportunity, he says, to preach, so he stayed to do it. You know, even though he was concerned over not hearing from them or, and also hearing uh, what was going on in that church there, uh, he said he had to be faithful to the open door that God uh, gave him. You see, Paul, as I've been saying uh, repeatedly now, his desire was to be walking with the Lord in his presence, that God was his audience. And because of that, he would only want to go where God was opening doors, <laughs> And when the door was open, like, we're, like he said here, uh, for ministry, then that's the one that he wanted to go through. And everything else was going to have to wait. And so that's the idea here. He keeps referring back to that incident because the Corinthians were a little bugged, it seems, in chapter 1, that Paul didn't come when he said he was going to once. And so he just keeps reminding him, look... <laughs> I am all about in the moment with the Lord, and you should be too. And so just because I didn't do something doesn't mean that I don't love you. It's just because there is this open door of ministry, and that's the way I was supposed to go. But he says this in verse 14. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. I just love that. You know, God desires to live through us. Isn't that awesome? God desires to live through us. And so, every place that you go, you are to bring the fragrance of Christ with you. In some way, you do, no matter what, who you are and what you're doing and what you say, in, in some way. But there's also an ability to increase that by your obedience in the Lord. Do you remember... Um, that one scene when Jesus is at uh, Mary and Martha's house and Mary goes and gets this little uh, bottle of costly perfume that she had and she breaks it and she anoints Jesus' feet with it and then wipes, wipes it off with her hair. <laughs> John says, I think it's John chapter 12, he says that the fragrance filled the whole house <laughs> of that costly perfume. And that's the idea here. That I think it's supposed to draw for us that your service to Jesus, your devotion to him is a pleasant aroma that's supposed to be taken in by everybody around you. And that's because, as he says there and what we just read in verse 14, you bring the knowledge of Jesus into every place that you go. Like when you walk into your office tomorrow or into your classroom or into your kitchen with that pile of dishes. <laughs> You're bringing the fragrance of Jesus with you. Because you see, when we, the, when we go places, what you bring, my, my, my fellow Christians here, what you bring with you is not found in the world's resources. You have something that can't be found and mined out of the ground here, or made or created. Despite our shortcomings, despite our failures, we are a fragrance of God in every place. That's kind of amazing to think about. And did you see that, that he said that God, in verse 14, always leads us to triumph? I love that. You can't lose. You're on the winning team. You see, the outcome for you is determined already. <laughs> the system is rigged. I've been uh, laughing because, um, not laughing, but sort of uh, well, watching how the Democrats and the Republicans in the election, both sides are saying that the system is rigged and the delegate, delegates thing. Have you been hearing about this? You know, Some think it's rigged. I think the losers think it's rigged <laughs> often, but 
But, you know, they're arguing about how they get the delegates and the superdelegates and all that. And it seems to me, maybe it's rigged, maybe it's not, I don't know. But it seems like that's the rules and they're just doing the rules, whatever. But I point that out because for you as a Christian, the system is rigged. <laughs> and it's rigged for your blessing, right? He, 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 God has already won the victory on the cross. It is finished. The enemy is defeated. And so he says there, because of that, he leads us in triumph in Christ. It's great news for you and I. He just wants us closer to him all the time. For we, look at verse 15, he talks more about this fragrance. He says, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ coming among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Okay, when he talks about aroma, he's not talking about actual good and bad smelling people. I hope you understand that. I used to work at a gym a long time ago, and there's a lot of interesting smelling people at the gym. But he's not talking about that. So let that one go. <laughs> He's talking about a spiritual fragrance upon us. It's the Christ-likeness that the Holy Spirit that's in you wants more of for you, for your life. Because it's the fragrance of Jesus. And that's where the Lord is leading us through this Bible study today. And I'll tell you what, when you spend more time with him than you spend on the internet and that you spend with anyone else, it rubs off on you. The more time that you spend with the Lord, the more that this fragrance uh, rubs off on you. And I'll tell you what, it's a privilege to wear it. It's a badge of honor that he gives you. Wonderful. Now, you might not notice it. <laughs> or you, you probably walk around and you forget that it's on you. But it's there. And everyone, he said there, everyone smells it. But not everybody likes it. Right? To some, it's a stench. And maybe you've experienced that. That someone, because of who you are, walking with Jesus, was repulsed by you. Well, <laughs> that's not your problem. That's between them and the Lord. You see, that just sort of reflective of where they are. And you pray for them, you love them, you continue to minister to them. But that's not your challenge. He said there that to God, you believers are the fragrance of Jesus among all the people. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. He says those who are, who are saved, you're a fragrance to, and also to those who are lost. You see, to the believers, he tells us that you guys are the aroma of life. I think about this sometimes when you're coming into the church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and when I see you around town, you all go, hey, look who's over there, you know. And uh, you're the aroma of life. You really are. But to those who reject the gospel, he just taught us there that you're also the smell of death. And you're like, how, well, how can it be both? How can I be both? Well, there's that saying, have you ever guys ever heard that saying that this, um, the same sun can melt wax but also hardened clay. You guys heard that expression before? It's the same idea, you know? So by who you are in the Lord, you can either smell like buttered popcorn to us <laughs> or a skunk, right? Because of their relationship to, to God. And so we are, in a, in a sense, just living reminders to people of Jesus, that he came, he's in the world, and they have an opportunity. They either live with him eternally or, or not. Now, did you see there in verse 16, he says something important. Well, it's all important, but I just wanted to draw your attention, where he asks a question, and he says, and who is sufficient for these things? He actually answers this question in the next chapter, verse 5. Uh, he says that, don't think that you're sufficient in yourselves. Our sufficiency is from God. So we're not supposed to forget that, you know. It's really kind of an, an interesting life that we get as believers because the Lord lives 
desires to live his life through you. And the way he, he does that is to exhort you and to, to remind you that he loves you and to lead you in triumph, those things that we've seen already. God lifts you Christians up just as high as you can go. But then he says, now don't get too full of yourself. <laughs> you can't do anything apart from me. Yes, you are loved. You are the aroma of life. But remain humble. <laughs> Remain dependent on me. And again, that's this whole idea of when God is, in, is, is our audience, we will remain humble. If he was sitting next to you, you would be a humble person. And he says, I will exalt you in due time. You just follow me. So I'd ask you this question, and then we'll finish with verse 17. What's the fragrance of your life like? Does your life bless the Lord and his saints? Do you convict the sinners with who you are just because you're Christ-like? Or is there something else going on? I think the Lord wants us to evaluate that or just sort of test these things in us personally. And we learn and grow from it. Well, let's finish verse 17. He says, For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. You know, in Paul's day, just like today, people would use spiritual things or God's word for their own personal gain. And isn't it sad when that happens? And folks do that, you know. People will twist the scriptures for their own personal gain. Or um, folks will make merchandise out of free things from the Lord. But Paul is basically saying, you know, I just want you guys to know something. I don't have any sort of axe to grind with you. I, I don't have an, a personal agenda that I'm trying to get across here. I am just giving you... The sincere word of God. And then it's up to you to digest it and to take it and to run with it. And I pray that that's what we do. You know, those of you who are in in ministry, serving God along with us, especially if you're giving out the word of God, that we would just do it with with simplicity and with sincerity so that a Christian or a non-Christian can both benefit from the ministry and that we wouldn't have an ax to grind or any sort of personal agenda that it would just be simple and sincere it's a great way to distribute the, the these glorious things of God well and finally here I think it's good to remember those last few words um, can can we just read that after the comma those last six or eight words there uh, where it says we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Let's say that together. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. Let's try and remember that together because, I mean, just imagine how much better our lives would be if we spoke and lived like we were in the sight of God all the time. What would your life be like if the Lord was with you wherever you go? He is. <laughs> What if he was there in person? You know, what would our ministries in this church be if God was present? How faithful would we be with what we're called to do if, if he was, if he was in our sight? You know, if we remember to do everything in the sight of God. What if we taught the Bible here or in our children's ministry or in our youth group or in our life groups? What if we did that? As if God was present in the audience. How about when we're in our car with our spouse driving home? What if God was present in the car with us? How would that change the way that we speak to one another? Do you conduct your life conscious that God is looking at what you're doing? (laughs) Because he is. And it can be a really great thing or it can be kind of troubling. And I just pray that this chapter 
ministers to you, like it's ministered to me, and that I would live my life, that you would live your life as if God is my audience everywhere I go. My thoughts, the things I say, what I don't say, how I say it, the way I approach my relationships, the way I approach my ministry, all those things is not just for me, it's for you. And I pray that we would live that way as if God was with us always, because he is. Well, let's stand and pray. Yes, Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we are so grateful that you give it and that how it just rightly divides uh, these things for us. And you help us, Lord, to test our heart and mind. And, and um, God, we just desire to walk in the spirit and not in the lust of our flesh. And so help us to fulfill that destiny uh, for us, God. And I pray for the saints here today as they uh, stay to minister to each other or they go off on their day that you would just help them to watch, walk in victory, Lord, because they're more than conquerors. And we appreciate that, what you've done for us, that you've rigged the system. And uh, we have uh, all the riches and glory in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. And then I also pray for those who don't know you yet and that you would draw them to you by your spirit, even now, as we sing this last song, and that, God, that you would uh, give hope to the hopeless, the future to the futureless. And we just thank you so much for the blessing in Christ Jesus that we have. And it's in, and it's in Jesus Christ's powerful name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. We're going to